Welcome on this December 14th, 1995. My name is Bob Wilson. I'm professor of church history at Acadia Divinity College. And this morning we're interviewing the Reverend Dr. Harold L. Mitten, former pastor, principal, and professor of Acadia Divinity College. Dr. Mitten, it's good to have you with us this morning and to have you share with us some of your life in the midst of these interviews. It's good to be here on this cold winter morning. <laughs> Dr. Mitten, you have been retired for a few years, so let's begin now and work backwards in the context of your life. Uh, what are you doing at this stage in your retirement? I was going to say not very much, but I, <clears throat> I must say that I'm enjoying retirement. I retired in 1991, and I find that each day is a challenge. I don't all agree, uh, altogether agree with uh, Robertson Davies and his description of the aging process. He says it's like a walk on a cold autumn afternoon with uh, the leaves all off the trees and the sun has set and a cold wind blows over the landscape. He says that's retirement. <laughs> but uh, I don't find it that bleak. Um, each day brings a challenge. And uh, Marguerite and I are reasonably active. Um, we enjoy good health. We have had some health problems, uh, but at the moment, aside from a few arthritic pains, we're, we're enjoying good health and uh, enjoying retirement. Okay. There, there are less uh, deadlines now in my life <laughs> than heretofore. <laughs> As we approach this Christmas season, I'm assuming you're going to be with family, that kind of thing. Why don't you tell us a bit about your family? Yes. Um, we're fortunate that both of our uh, families are in the Halifax area. My son Ronald practices law. His wife Susan is direct regional director for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. They have uh, two children, um, Julia, who is age 12, and John, who is age 10. Both very interesting uh, grandchildren. Julia is very interested in ballet and is currently starring in the Nutcracker uh, yes. Ballet in Halifax. John, uh, he is more interested in athletics. Uh, he's a very interesting chap. When he was seven years old, we were out for a walk one day, and I said to him, John, are, are you going to be a lawyer like your father when you grow up or a preacher like your grandfather? He said, I'm going to be a preacher. And then a few minutes later, he said, uh, what does a preacher do? <laughs> <laughs> he had committed himself before fully <laughs> realizing what it was all about. Now, my daughter also lives in Halifax. She was trained in education, and she uh, was married last summer. And uh, so we have um, both of our families in close proximity. And your daughter's name? Is Ruth. Ruth. Yes. You've lived in Wolfville some years now, and it, you've made it your home in retirement. Uh, why did you decide to stay in Wolfville? What do you like about living in Wolfville? I fell in love with Wolfville when I came here as a freshman in 1940, and uh, never dreamed, of course, that I would return after my studies or retire here. But I find it's an ideal place in, in which to retire. Uh, it has so much going for it. It's a place of beauty. And then, of course, um, with the university nearby, uh, we are able to attend um, fine arts concerts and lectures. And I enjoy going to athletic contests. And, um, of course, the Divinity College is nearby and, and the library. Uh, so that uh, there are many, many uh, advantages of living in Wolfville. You and I share some common origins since we both come from Moncton, and uh, I'd be interested to hear about that Monctonian background and your early family. So why don't you begin there with, with your family and, and uh, when you were born and that kind of information for us. Yes. This may startle your hearers to know that I was born uh, on December 20th, 1919. Um, my father's name was Clifford John Mitten, 
My mother's maiden name was Eva Isabel Logan. The, um, my father grew up in Wheaton Settlement and my mother in Marysville and both were members of uh, the United Baptist Church in their community. North River in my father's case and Marysville was the uh, church um, home of my mother. Dr. Minton, with your parents living in quite divergent places, how did they meet and did you have siblings in the household? Yes, um, my father, as I intimated, grew up in uh, Wheaton Settlement. When he was 18 years old, a um, tragic thing happened to him. He was working with the Gypsum Company in Hillsboro as a brakeman and one day fell between the rail cars and was severely injured in consequence of which uh, his right uh, leg had to be amputated. He had thought at one time of studying for the ministry, I discovered this later, but he went to Fredericton Business College following the accident and uh, my mother attended uh, the same college and that's where they met. She in time became private secretary to um, Fred Chestnut, who was president of the Chestnut Canoe Company. So uh, that's where they met, and um, I think that was in 1914 that they were married. And um, my um, brother Don was uh, born, uh, he was the first in the family, uh, two years later. And um, so when I came on the scene, I, as I said, I had a sibling rival and we sometimes um, got along, sometimes we didn't, as uh, happens with brothers. As I remember your brother Don, he was somewhat larger than you are as well, and so I can imagine in sibling rivalries you had to learn to take your own part. That's true. That's <laughs> very, very true. In the midst of your family life, they were church folk. You mentioned that they went to church, but then they moved to Moncton, and yes. that's where you grew up. What church did you attend in Moncton, and what was that church like in those days? When my father and mother were first married, they came to Amherst to live, and then they later moved to Moncton, where they attended First Baptist Church. They later moved to the west end of Moncton, and then we, they became members of the Highfield Street Baptist Church. My father sang in the choir, my mother was very active in the church and became in time a superintendent of the Sunday school. So my brother Don and I were taken to church uh, to Highfield. It was a strenuous affair in those days because we went three times a day. Um, morning worship, Sunday school at 2.30 and the evangelistic evening service at 7. And I can remember um, sometimes I was a bit bored as a child and I would count the organ pipes at the front of the church, frontwards and backwards, um, I suppose, to, uh, to overcome my boredom. But uh, I had good training at Highfield. I went to Sunday school and went later to Cubs and to Scouts. And um, so I, I owe a great deal to those who, um, who uh, were my leaders at Highfield. It was a good church. I wonder if you could tell us about who the pastors of the church were in those days and some of your remembrances of them. Uh, the first um, pastor I can remember, and this is somewhat dimly, was a Mr. Cochran, a very gracious man, and he was followed by a Rever uh, Mr. Richardson, who uh, was a very warm and friendly man. Um, but the uh, pastor uh, uh, whom I recall with um, with greatest uh, clarity would be the Reverend A.K. Herman. Um, so uh, uh, Highfield had uh, some good pastors during my childhood and early adolescence. At what point did Christ first become real to you in the midst of your spiritual pilgrimage? I was 12 years of age when I um, had what you might call a spiritual awakening uh, my mother uh, was a very dedicated Christian and I often think it was uh, my mother who opened to me 
the door into the kingdom, first of all. But um, I had a wonderful Sunday school teacher by the name of Fred Hislop. Uh, he worked in the CNR um, roundhouse. He was a laborer. He taught a, a group of 12-year-old boys. And um, he, uh, he, he, he loved boys. He used to take us to what we called the natural park for picnics in the summertime. One Christmas he gave us a, all a pen knife, kind of a knife where you press something on one end and the blade would be released. And um, I formed the impression that I would like to be like Mr. Hissop. And if he was a Christian, I wanted to be a Christian. And uh, the opportunity soon presented itself. A Dr. Mahood came from Chicago to hold evangelistic services. And I went forward uh, in one of the services to receive Christ. And um, in those days, we, those who made uh, such a decision were taken to the inquiry room. And uh, Deacon Chester Eagles, who is the father of Professor Ed Eagles, who uh, teaches here at Acadia, uh, told me uh, of the significance of the step uh, that I had taken and told me of Jesus' claim upon my life. And I was later baptized by uh, my pastor, Reverend A.K. Herman. Someone has said that there are four red-letter days in your life. The day you are born, the day you are baptized, the day you are married, and the day you die. And I can truthfully say that um, even though I was only 12, uh, the, my baptism was a red-letter day in my life. I rose from those baptismal waters with a feeling of elation that's difficult to describe. In your Moncton experience, you haven't told us yet about your education. Where did you go to school in the early years, and what about your high school years? I went to a number of schools. I went, <clears throat> first of all, to Victoria Street School, and uh, then to Edith Cavell, <coughs> excuse me, and then to Prince Street School, and uh, did very well. I stood to the top of my class in those years. But then I went on to high school, to Aberdeen High School, and I had drifted away from my original commitment to Christ. I guess, as some people do, I was in the wilderness, and I became absorbed in athletics, so much so that my uh, studies suffered. I went through grade nine okay, just sort of drifting along. But when I came to grade 10, it was a different matter, and I failed a grade, and much to uh, the disgust of my father and the disappointment of my mother, and they thought I needed, uh, I guess, an introduction to the work ethic. So after, I guess it was back even after grade nine, they saw that I was slipping. And I was encouraged to go to work on my uh, uncle's farm in, in Wheaton Settlement. And after grade 10, the year I f failed in high school, I, was, I worked at um, Charlie Cox's farm near Allison. And um, when I returned to grade 11, I had uh, incentive then to do something with my life. And uh, they had an arrangement, uh, Bob, in those days, that if you made 80 or 85 in the first term of, of, grade, uh, of the grade 10 that I was repeating, you could go on in January to grade 11 with the hope of completing uh, grade 11 in a half a year. Well, I made the 80 or 85, whatever it was, and. Uh, and then went on and I completed grade 11 and a half a year. So really I had atoned for my failure. <laughs> but during Moncton High School, I was engrossed in playing hockey and um, baseball and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, and my studies, I'm afraid, suffered until the last end of things. What did you then do after high school when you were looking for a profession? Well, I remember being uh, graduated from Moncton High. We had moved to what they called the new high school built by Wheeler Construction Company, and I was a member of the first class graduated from that new school in 1936. Um, but uh, the uh, depression had made its, uh, the economic depression was still being felt in Moncton, and it was very, very difficult to get a job. I went to employment agencies day after day and uh, to no avail. 
But then um, I got a job, very menial job, as a messenger for the Canadian National Telegraph Office and worked there for a few months. And then I worked for Swift Canadian Company, a meatpacking industry in Moncton. There were only a few places where you could work in Moncton in those days. You either worked at Eaton's or um, at Swift's uh, or um, uh, in the CNR Railways or at Marvin's Biscuit Fan factory. So um, I went to Swift's and uh, worked there for four years. First as mail clerk and then as a typist and then as private secretary to the superintendent of the plant. During those years uh, you continued to attend church and I'm interested in Highfield in those days because you came from that congregation, your brother Don came from the congregation, uh, Stuart Murray was a member of the congregation in those days, mm -hmm. and all of you went on to give significant leadership in the church. Uh, was there a dynamic in the church of that days that inspired you to that? I'm just curious what the youth group was like and what was happening there. Yes, uh, Highfield um, attracted a lot of young people in those days, and uh, we had good leaders. Uh, we called it the BYPU, the Baptist Young People's Union. And we learned a lot of um, leadership skills, and um, there was a strong spiritual emphasis. I, I mentioned my uh, sort of wayward years following my baptism, but when I was 16, just about the time I was gradu being graduated from high school, uh, the real turning point in my life occurred. Uh, and Andrew G., a Chinese evangelist, came to Moncton calling for a radical commitment of one's life to Christ. And uh, I, uh, I made that commitment, and my life was changed. And thereafter, I became interested in spiritual things. I taught a, a class of uh, boys in Highfield, and I attended uh, workshops for lay preachers conducted by a Deacon Mills and First Baptist mm -hmm. Church. And I joined a gospel team. I could name the, the young men that were in it. We went uh, uh, and occupied pulpits of, uh, that were vacant or uh, uh, supplied pulpits where the pastor was on vacation. And most interesting of all, I became attached to the Lighthouse Mission in Moncton, which operated in Lewis and uh, Pearl Streets, was ca called the Bowery in those days. And I preached my very first sermon when I was 16 on the words of Paul, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, I don't know what my outline was. It must have been very simple for I had no training whatsoever. Uh, it, it perhaps wasn't as, um, as memorable as um, a sermon on the prodigal son uh, which was devised by a, a homiletical student. He had three points uh, uh, with regard to the parable. Uh, goes to the dogs, feeds the hogs, and homeward jogs. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm sure that uh, my first sermon wasn't as memorable as that. But it, uh, those were great years for me following my recommitment. In some ways, Bob, I think my recommitment was even more significant in my life um, than the, the original uh, experience of Christ. Uh, there were great years, those four years. How do you then put this in the place of call to ministry? Is this the point at which you then felt God leading you towards pastoral ministry for life? Yes, I think I must have been 19 years of age when I sensed um, a stirring within me, um, a, a call to uh, proclaim the gospel. I had done quite a bit of lay work, but I was very happy as a layman, and I did not I, I, I want to go into the ministry. I, I, I shrank from that, partly because I, I'm basically shy, I used to say that I'd rather take a beating than to uh, to give a, uh, any kind of a recitation in a Sunday school concert. So I shrank from it for quite a long while. But uh, the uh, conflict became intense. So uh, I guess I would be 20 years old when I decided I would go to uh, Camp Chickadee Hawk 
for the purpose of reflecting upon what I should do with my life. And it was there that I uh, made my final decision to um, abandon my work at Swift's and to uh, pursue uh, training that would lead to the ministry. That's quite a long story. I don't know w whether you want me to enlarge upon it. I would like to because I'm interested in what was happening at Chickatahawk at those times. Were there yes. quite a few young people there? Because sometimes that's part of our history that we lose in terms of the ministry of camps and those ministries. I'm, I'm not sure why uh, a lad from Moncton went to uh, Bristol in Carrollton County to attend Chickatahawk camp, but I, I had heard of it through Stedman Smith. Mm -hmm who was one of our leaders, and um, Myron Britton was uh, uh, giving leadership there. So anyway, I, I went to, um, to Chickadee Hawk, and it was a good place. There were Bible studies and vespers and campfires, a, good, a very good place to reflect upon uh, the decision that I had to make. And one morning, we were in a little evergreen grove uh, and the pastor of First Baptist Church in Myers Hill, Maine, came over to speak to us, and he took that text in Isaiah, uh, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame be enkindled upon thee. And even as he spoke, I felt that tap on the shoulder, which is hard to describe. And I felt that even though there were obstacles in my way, of ever getting an education, that God would see me through. And when I left that evergreen grove that morning, the decision had been made. May I just follow up on one thing that shows my interest rather than necessarily this. You mentioned Stedman Smith and his role. He'd been active in Highfield. Yes. He will also become a pastor in a couple of the churches and will be one of those, I think, who will take a couple of churches out of convention as time goes on. If yes. It, that's the same Stedman Smith? Yes. The Stedman Smith that I know was a very, very gracious uh, and able pastor. Mm -hmm. But something along the line uh, happened whether he became disillusioned, but he became somewhat, um, someone almost embittered, and his, uh, his whole personality seemed to change. And I, I felt it was so sad because the Stedman Smith that I knew when I went to camp was such a resourceful pastor, very able man, and um, he, he, he had a great influence on my life. In fact, later we used to go fishing salmon together, and Stedman Smith was one of the best salmon fishermen I ever oh, really? knew. Yeah. Because he became the founding pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, if I remember correctly. That's right. Yes. Well, when you were looking then for a place to study uh, and called a ministry, you chose to come to Acadia. Now, not many people from Highfield were always thinking about Acadia as the place to go. Why did you choose Acadia? Well, I mentioned... Um, that after I uh, that when I left the Evergreen Grove that morning, I knew uh, what I should do. The amazing thing was that the very next day, Dr. F. W. Patterson, the president of Acadia University, came to visit the camp, and I asked for an interview with him and told him what had happened. I told him I had saved six hundred dollars, and I could never think of going to university on such a small amount of money. But he uh, he said to me, Harold, if you feel called. I think you should come in September and leave the rest to God. So um, I thought that over and went back to Moncton. But as you say, Bob, uh, not too many people in Highfield at that time encouraged me to go on to university because they thought I'd perhaps be robbed of my faith and my enthusiasm. And uh, it was a choice between Mount Allison and Acadia because Mount A, as you know, is near Moncton. But uh, after, after having talked with Dr. Patterson, I decided I would uh, come to Acadia. Now, that was in 1940? That 1940, 1940 first yes. arrived. Yes. What was Acadia like in those days? It, it, it'll interest you to know that uh, I came by bus to Parsboro and I came over to Wolfville on the Kippewa, which plied the waters of the Minas Basin coming from Parsboro over to Kingsport, and then I s sailed into the modest harbor in Wolfville. And my first sight of Acadia University was from the decks of the Kippewa. Uh, I saw the tower, 
of the University Hall and the uh, autumn leaves behind it. As I said earlier in this interview, I fell in love with the place instantly. I got off to a great start. It's amusing in some ways. Um, I was sent to a room in what they call the Vatican, which was an auspicious beginning for a Protestant pastor. It was uh, owned by uh, an inimitable character by the name of Pope Borden. Uh, that was his nickname, and um, that's where I, how I began my um, my life at Acadia. But if you want me to tell you about my years at Acadia, I would like to hear that, please. Uh, that's quite a long story. You, uh, well, let's let's begin with those first years. Uh, what kind of subjects were you taking as a pre theologue and and what were the professors whom you had in the early days? Yes. Um, well, I took four years of undergraduate study at Acadia. Uh, in my uh, freshman year, I decided that I would uh, try to identify with life on the campus. Uh, I turned out for English rugby, and uh, that was a bruising sport, as I recall. And I, um, it, these were war years. I, I belonged to the Canadian Officers Training Corps. Corps, and we had to um, parade each day, mind you, uh, in full battle dress for an hour, an hour and a half. And um, then I uh, joined the Athenaeum staff. I don't know what I was trying to prove. And also, uh, through the prodding of my professor of English, Harold Fritz Sipril, I joined the Dramatic Society and appeared in a few plays. In my sophomore year, um, I continued uh, these extracurricular activities as well as my as well as my studies, but I um, became quite active in the Wolfville Baptist Church, singing in the choir. I had done that in my first year as well, and in my second year, I became pastor of what was called the Wolfville Tabernacle, and held services every Sunday night uh, in the um, hall which is now, uh, or the building rather, which is now occupied by the Canadian Legion. And in my uh, junior and senior years, I moved up to being editor-in-chief, if you can believe it, of the Athenaeum, and I achieved what was called distinction in dramatics, um, having completed the right number of uh, units, uh, participating in a number of, of plays, and uh, when I graduated, I was asked to be the valedictorian of the class. I owe a great deal to uh, Acadia University, especially to its president, Dr. F. W. Patterson, who took a deep personal interest in me. But Dr. Mitten, this may be a convenient spot for us to stop for our first interview. We'd like to thank you very much for being with us and sharing so much of your early life, and we look forward to the rest of the story. Thank you.